appreciate the presence of every person this morning. We have visitors with us, and we're glad that you're here and hope you can come back and be with us at other times. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, we'll be dealing with the New Testament church, continuing a study there. Come back and be with us in a part of that study. But for this morning, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. We're working our three, way through the book of Galatians, and we're ready for chapter 5, which begins the third major section of the book. The book of Galatians is about being justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. The heart of the book is chapters 3 and 4, but in chapters 1 and 2, he defends his apostleship. And then in chapters 3 and 4, he gets to that message of justification by faith apart from the deeds of the law. And chapter 5 begins the last two chapters, which deals with what we call a practical section. Not that the other is not practical, but this has to do more with application of how the child of God lives. How you're justified, chapters 3 and 4. Here's how he lives, chapters 5 and 6. Now, here's what we saw in chapter 1. Let's kind of put, uh, lace all of this together. In chapter 1, his point was, I am an apostle, not of men, but of God. He made the claim in verse 1 that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he provided evidence at the end of the chapter, the last part of the chapter, where he talks about his life before his conversion, the point of his conversion, his first visit to Jerusalem and his stay in Syria and Cilicia. All of that gave evidence that he had not spent time with the apostles to learn from them the revelation that he was able to preach now. And then he says in chapter 2, not only am I an apostle of God and not after man, I'm not an inferior apostle to the other apostles that I went to that Jerusalem conference in Acts chapter 15 and I was approved by the apostles. They accepted and embraced me and gave me the right hand of fellowship and furthermore, the message that I preached stood the confrontation with Peter. And in fact, I rebuked Peter with the very gospel that I'm preaching and that is called into question. Now then, chapter three got to the heart of the book that one is justified by faith in Christ and not by the deeds of the law. And so he said that we receive the Spirit by faith, not through the deeds of the law. Abraham was justified by faith, not by the law. The law actually brings a curse. The promise was given before the law. The purpose of the law was to bring men unto Christ. And so consequently, we're justified by faith and not by the deeds of the law. Chapter 4 says we have freedom through Christ. And that's important because we're going to talk about that liberty and freedom. But freedom comes through Christ, but bondage came through the law. We're sons and we're free and we're heirs. We're no longer under bondage. So why do you want to go back into bondage? And then he gave this allegory that Abraham had two sons and those two sons represent the two laws, two dispensations, and one was free, the other was in bondage. Now then, we're ready for chapter 5. Chapter 5 we call stand fast, stand firm in the liberty you have gained through Christ and do not go back again unto bondage. And we base that off of verse 1. Verse 1 said, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. You've been made free by Christ. He, you are redeemed by Christ. We'll see more about that in the context here in a moment. But you are redeemed by Christ. You are liberated from the bondage of sin by the Lord Jesus Christ. So stand fast. Stand firm in that liberty. Don't move from it. And do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Don't do that. But here's what happens in chapter 5. Three things. In verses 1 to 6, don't go back to circumcision and the law. And then verses 7 to 12, he said, don't listen to these false teachers. He's alluded to those in chapter 1. And last, the last chapter, he talked about how they court you. They're courting you. They're, they're trying to woo you and, and persuade you. And then he says, liberty that we have in Christ is to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. It gets very practical in that section. So let's start working through this verses 1 to 6. Don't go back to the circumcision and the law. Notice verse 1, first of all, stand fast in liberty by which Christ has made us free and not be entangled again to the yoke of bondage. What he's talking about is going back to the bondage of the law. Any Jew who had been under the bondage of the law understood that the regulations of the law brought bondage. There was nothing in the law 
that provided liberty. All the law did was pronounce man guilty of sin. So go back under the law of Moses. While they were under the law of Moses, what the law did was pronounce judgment and pronounce sin. And they were under the bondage of the law because the law had no provision for liberty at all. That comes through Christ. Now, it's also true that the Gentiles were under the bondage of sin before they became, and many Gentiles are being written to in this letter because he's writing to the churches of Galatia. Were there some Jews? Obviously. But were there Gentiles? Largely there were. Who had come out of the bondage of sin, and his question is going to be, once you've come out of the bondage of sin, why do you want to go back to a different form of bondage? It's like getting out of prison, but I want to go to a different prison. Once you're liberated, why do you want to go back to bondage again? So here's how he begins. He said, if you go back to circumcision and the law, by the way, circumcision was not just the act of circumcision, but it was being practiced by the Jews as a condition of salvation. You have to be circumcised in order to be among God's people. And that stood for the adherence to the law, the whole law, that is trying to go back and live by the Old Testament law. So why do you want to go back to circumcision and the law? If you do that, Christ will profit you nothing. So let's get verse 2 now. He said at verse 2, indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Is he saying that one should not be circumcised at all? Well, it's going to say later that circumcision doesn't profit anything. It doesn't matter, in other words, whether you're circumcised. So... He's not saying if you're circumcised, Christ doesn't profit. But if you practice it as a religious rite, if you practice it and bind it as a condition of salvation, then Christ will profit you nothing. Paul had Timothy circumcised on one occasion, but refused to have Titus circumcised. There's nothing wrong with the circumcision within itself, but it has to do with binding it as a condition of salvation and making it a requirement of God. And telling someone, you have to be circumcised or you can't be saved. So now let's go back to verse 2. I say if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. What we saw earlier in the book, let's back up just a little bit. And notice that in verse 17 of chapter 2, that we seek to be justified by Christ. Verse 16, that a man is justified by faith in Christ. uh, What does Christ have to do with all of this? Well, we're we're justified by Christ. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3 said that one is Christ has redeemed us, verse 13, from the curse of the law. We're redeemed through Christ. Chapter 4 had said the same thing at verse 5, that Christ was born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. So redemption comes through Christ, and if you go back under the law and start binding circumcision as a condition of salvation, you listen to these Judaizing teachers, Christ is not going to profit you at all. In other words, you no longer have redemption. Now let's skip to verse 4. We're coming back to verse 3. You have become estranged from Christ. You're separated from Christ. So Christ isn't going to profit you. The, The redemption, the salvation He offers is not for you. And you're separated from your Redeemer anymore. If you go back under the law, there are consequences to listening to these false teachers. Secondly, He said you're better to keep the whole law. Look at verse 3. He said, I testify again to every man who's become circumcised, he's a debtor to keep the whole law. We see the same thing in James 2, that that the law came as a package deal. It cannot be piecemealed. In other words, you can't, it's not like a smorgasbord that you go through and look at the law and say, I want some of this, I want some of that, I want to reject that, I want to reject that, I'm not interested in that at all, I'll take what I want. It comes as a package deal. You want to bind circumcision? You want to bind keeping the law of Moses, you're bound to keep all of it. That involves the sacrifices, the feast. So start killing your bulls, start killing your lambs. Start start offering your sacrifices. Start uh, uh, observing your feast. You're going to have to do all of the things that are found in the law if you're going to keep the law. It comes as a package deal. You're better to keep the whole law. Now let me stop and footnote for a moment. There are people today who want to go back and take part of the law. There are some who want to burn incense in in worship. And so you say, where do you get that? Well, we find that in the Old Testament where they burned incense. We want that part of the law. Someone else says, "I, I, I want to use instrumental music. Well, where do you find that? We find that in the Old Testament. I want that part of the law. And someone else said, well, I, we, we keep the Sabbath. 
And so we want to go back and we want to pull out that section of the law. We like that section of the law. All right? Take your law, but you're going to have to take all of it. Where's your bulls that you're offering? Where's the other sacrifices that you're offering? Are you keeping the feast of... Are you dwelling in booze? Are you keeping all the law? No, they don't want the whole law. They just want a portion of that. And so were these Judaizing teachers. They wanted circumcision. They wanted the law. But they didn't want to keep all the law. He said, you're debtor to keep the whole law. Now, verse 4, you're fallen from grace. If you go back to circumcision and the law, you're fallen from grace. Look at verse 4, you become estranged from Christ. You attempt to be justified by the law. You've become fallen from grace. You had received the grace of God. Notice back in chapter 1, God who had called you into the grace. Notice back in chapter 1. That uh, in verse 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him who called you into the grace of Christ, into a different gospel. In other words, when you obeyed the gospel, you received the grace of Christ. And now he said you're fallen from grace. It's possible for a child of God to fall from grace. He said when you do that, you go back and listen to the Old Testament and you uh, bind that as circumcision and bind that as a condition of salvation, you're fallen from grace. Now in verses 5 and 6, his point is circumcision doesn't avail anything. That doesn't make you closer to God, doesn't drive you further away from God within itself. In other words, God doesn't care one way or the other if you're circumcised. But what God does care about is having faith in Christ. So let's get verse 5. For we through the Spirit, through the direction of the Spirit, through the instruction of the Spirit. We'll see more about that later in this chapter and in chapter 6. But anyway, at verse 5, but we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. What is the hope of righteousness? Is it the hope to be righteous? But he's already told us in chapters four, uh, 3 and 4, they had redeemed by the law. They had become righteous through the law. I think it is that hope of eternal life based on the fact that you're enabled to be righteous before God. It's the hope of those who are righteous. The hope based upon being righteous before God through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we eagerly, through the direction of the Spirit, through the instruction of the Spirit, are waiting for the hope of eternal life, and we're doing that through faith. Not faith alone, but through faith in Christ, which includes obedience, and we'll see evidence of that in the next verse. Now at verse 6, for in, circ- for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. This is an active faith. See, what God's interested in is not circumcision, but what God's interested in is an active faith. Now, I want to notice some parallel verses here. Now, get this, get this concept. And see if these other verses doesn't help identify the meaning of this. What does he mean by faith working through love? What does he mean by that? Well, let's go in the same book. Let's go over to chapter 6 and in verse 15. Same book. Chapter 6, look at verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Sounds familiar. But a new creation. That you are a new creature in Christ. God doesn't care if you're circumcised or uncircumcised, Jew or Gentile. What God cares is if you are a new creature in Christ. How did you get to be a new creature in Christ? Through faith, working through love, through an active faith. Let's notice another verse that's parallel. Go to 1 Corinthians 7 and in verse 19. 1 Corinthians 7 and in verse 19. He said circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Sound familiar? But keeping the commands of God is what matters. You want a good commentary on what means faith working by love? But Paul, what do you mean by faith working by love? Well, what you told the Corinthians was, what I told them over here Paul is saying, I told them circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't avail anything, but keeping the commandments of God is what avails. That's what it means, faith working through love. It's an active faith, keeping the commandments of God. And that makes you a new creation, chapter 6, verse 15. Those two verses, three verses rather, combined together to give us a fuller picture. So don't go back to circumcision and the law. If you do, you're going to have to keep the whole law. Christ is going to profit you nothing. You've given up grace. What really matters is, is faith that works through love. Now beginning at verse 7 through verse 12, don't listen to these false teachers. Let's stop in footnote for a moment. 
Quite often, people want to read and study the New Testament. I, I want to hear positive things, someone says. I, I, I want to hear instruction of the Lord. I don't care about all this refuting of error. I don't, I'm not interested in that. And I don't hear sermons. And uh, I, I'm not interested in reading that kind of stuff about this one is teaching error and that one's teaching. I just want to hear the positive things of God. All right, let's do that. And, and start tearing out passages that deal with false teaching and you're going to take out most of your New Testament. You're going to get rid of it. Because the New Testament warns again and again and again and again and again about false teaching. And that was a problem here in the churches of Galatia. He said, don't listen to these false teachers. Remember, we, we talked in our last study about how they're courting you. They're showing interest in you. They're trying to persuade you away from me, Paul said. Don't listen to them. And he starts with this. He said, they have influenced you, verses 7 to 9. This has been enough of a threat that these false teachers have said enough and done enough that Paul has to write this letter in defense of himself as an apostle and the defense of a doctrine that he's been teaching. He said, they have influence. In fact, they have removed you from that grace into another gospel, chapter 1. And he says this, he says, you were running well. I like the King James rendering of that. You did run well. You ran well, he said. You were doing good. You were on the right course. You were running your race. You were advancing far. You were excelling in the gospel. And something happened. A false teacher got a hold of them. Quite often I've seen people, and you have too, who, who obey the gospel and they start growing and they're maturing. And you're so proud of what you see them doing. And they're just growing and they're maturing and they're advancing and they're going and they're growing. And then someone comes along and begins to meddle with them a little bit and indoctrinates them a little bit and pulls them away from the solid gospel. And so he raises this question at verse 7. He said, who hindered you from obeying the truth? He said, these false teachers have influenced you. You were doing well, but they hindered you from obeying the truth. Some translations will use the word stop. One writer talks about that this is used of ancient wars. Of defending yourself against an advancing enemy. That gigantic holes are, are some kind of uh, uh, slits, as he would call them, but some kind of uh, cut in the road so that the army that it is pursuing you cannot advance. So we picture the army is coming down the road, and so you dig this big ditch so that they cannot get their horses and their, their, their whatever across. And the army is across that, so you dig this gigantic hole. And as they begin to advance, that's a hindrance. Something is impeding them from making their progress. So picture the Christian running the Christian race and he's running down the track and suddenly somebody's put a big hole in the path so he cannot go any further. There is some impedance in the way. There's some hindrance in the way. And so what false teachers do is they throw something in your path or they dig the path out so that you cannot advance. Who hindered you so that you're not obeying the truth? It's possible to be hindered in our obedience to the truth. There can be a number of hindrances. It could be error. It could be, be somebody's example. It could be discouragement on the one hand. A number of things can hinder us from obeying the truth. So who hindered you <clears throat> from obeying the truth? <clears throat> then he said, this is not from the one who called you. Now, by chapter 1, you've been called by the gospel. You've been called by Jesus Christ. But he said, that this persuasion, that this hindrance... <clears throat> This pull in that direction didn't come from him who called you. Look at verse 8. For this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Now let's drop down to verse 11. He said, I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. See, I'm not preaching that doctrine that you're following. I'm not preaching what these teachers are telling you. What I'm preach, preaching came from the revelation of God. It didn't come from God. This, this persuasion didn't come from God. It came from someone else. So therefore it's erroneous. Here's the danger. Verse 9. He said a little leaven leavens the whole lot. Sound familiar? Sure it does. 
You're probably more familiar with that in the context of 1 Corinthians 5, where verse 6 talks about this fornicator in their midst, if they didn't deal with the sin in their midst, it could leaven the whole lot. In that context, that phrase applied to sin permeating the church. A little leaven leavens a whole lot. In this context, it's not talking about sin within itself. It's an immoral act, but it's talking about error. It's talking about error. False teaching can permeate the whole church. A little leaven leavens a whole lot. So if it, there's sin in the midst and it's not dealt with, it can permeate the whole church and influence the whole church. If error is not dealt with, it can permeate the whole church. There's a danger. So what if error is being circulated? What if error is being taught? You say, well, let's just ignore it. No, 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 you don't ignore it. It'll permeate the whole church. A little leaven leavens a whole lump, he said. Now, he said, they have influenced you. But I'm confident that you're going to turn from these false teachers. I'm very confident of that. Look at verse 10. For I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you have no other mind. I really think you've been grounded. I really think that you know what's right. I really think the persuasion I'm giving you in this letter is going to pull you in the right direction. I think you know enough of the, of the scriptures. I think you know enough of the revelation of God. And when I give you evidence of my apostleship and give you evidence that this is the truth, that you're going to be on the right course. I have confidence in you. They've influenced you. But don't listen to them. And here's one reason you don't need to listen to them. These false teachers face judgment themselves. And if I can be convinced this man who is teaching me this doctrine is going to pay a price for teaching that doctrine, then I need to be very careful in listening to that doctrine. Quite often, we, we think there, there's real no danger at all. The man teaching false doctrine is going to pay a price. Now let's get to verse 10b. Look at verse 10b. He said, but he who troubles you. Verse 7, they hindered you. That's the idea of troubling them. He who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Doesn't matter. It might be in the churches of Galatia. Maybe a Judaizing teacher that came in. It might have been one of the elders that got persuaded. Maybe a preacher of the gospel. May have been one of the deacons. May have been an influential. Whoever it is, he's going to pay a price. He faces judgment. Faces a consequence. Now verse 12 is quite interesting and quite powerful. I often say we footnote. I'm going to footnote here. If this were in an article, I'd footnote this and say quite often people are offended by abrasive language. I'm not talking about courage. I'm talking about just strong language. They're offended by that. Wait, that's just not, that's not politically correct. And I want to tell you, you're about to read. If you hadn't already read, when we get to verse 12, that is very abrasive. That wouldn't go over in today's crowd. And here's what Paul says. He said, I could wish that those who trouble you were even cut off, cut themselves off. He said, no big deal. Some of you are looking very closely at that verse because you're thinking, that's not the way mine reads. The English Standard Version says, I wish they would emasculate themselves. That's pretty stout language, I'm going to tell you. The American Standard said, I wish they would mutilate themselves. Some of even, some translation will say, I wish they'd castrate themselves. The footnote in the NET said, and this is not a direct quote, I didn't write it down, but it said something to the effect that Paul wanted the Galatians to know how upset he was. <laughs> you think? <laughs> you think he wanted them to know how upset he was? In other words, that they're, they're, they're set on circumcision. That's what they want to do. I wish they'd go further. He is not suggesting someone mutilate themselves, but he said that if they did, here's the point, here's the effect of that, they would cut themselves off from the Jews and from the Christians and lose their influence. And that's what he's after. He is very upset. Now, if you think that's, that's stout and 
Let's go over to Philippians chapter 3 and in verse 2. <laughs> Talking about the same kind of people. He said, beware of dogs. He calls false teachers dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. That's not the only time he used that kind of stout language. Abrasive language. If this were on television, he'd be probably bleeped out and consequently be removed. And uh, it's not politically correct to talk that way. And yet that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I tell you, I'm upset with these teachers and he said, they face judgment, and I would, I would that they just would do that. Wish they would. And destroy their influence because they're damaging and they're bringing a damnable error into the church. Don't listen to them. They've influenced you. I'm confident you're going to turn away. They face judgment. Don't listen to these teachers. Now, the rest of the chapter starts getting into the practical section. So he said, they have influenced you. Don't go back to circumcision. Now then, this liberty that you have through Christ is a liberty to walk after the Spirit, not to do whatever you want. Quite often people have this idea that I want to be free, and they talk about being free in Christ. I want to be free. I want freedom to do whatever I want. No one has the freedom to do what they want. You go back under the law, keep the law. You're not free to do whatever you want. Okay, I don't want that, that freedom, that, that liberty. I want the liberty in Christ. Well, you're not free to do whatever you want there either. You can't do that. It's not the way liberty works. This liberty is to walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Now, start with verse 13 through verse 15. He makes a point about loving one another. He says at verse 13, as, he said, For you, brethren, you've been called to liberty. You see, being redeemed in Christ brought liberty. You've been called to liberty. Only do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh to do the desires of the flesh, but through love serve one another. In other words, liberty doesn't give you the, the privilege to do whatever I want to do. But this liberty involves loving one another. For all is fulfilled in the one word, even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You take this principle of love, what's his point is that love, what love does, if you love your neighbor, you're going to fulfill all other laws towards your neighbor. Now verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Now that's a little strange to us. When I say strange to us, because if, if this were our first reading of the book of Galatians, this kind of throws me a curve here, because he's been talking about doctrinal things up to this point, addressing false teachers and being influenced by false teachers, and then suddenly he talks about there's a need for love, and if you bite and devour one another. Apparently, apparently, there was some of that going on in the church, churches of Galatia. That happens not only in the churches of Galatia, that's happened all through time. Where, where there's gossip about one another. Where there's bickering toward one another. And here's this like dogs who bite and they fight and they devour until one of them is killed. And he said, if that keeps on, and if you're biting and devouring and you're arguing and you're fussing and you're gossiping, and you're just dog against dog in fights. You're going to be consumed. Somebody's going to get killed. Not literally. Maybe that could happen. But you're going to destroy one another. And destroy the church. And I want to tell you that's happened in a number of places. Where, where brethren were biting and arguing and devouring one another. till they just destroy the church in that locale. That's happened in place after place. I've known of churches where you didn't want people to visit. You didn't want visitors to come. Because she was afraid you, they'd see a fight in the vestibule. I mean, an argument in the vestibule. You bite and devour, you're going to destroy the church. And so he said, this liberty called you to love one another, not to bite and devour one another. What this liberty means is you're going to walk in and be led by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, by the direction of the Spirit. So he said, look at verse, verse, verse 16. He said, I say then, walk in the Spirit. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? You're led by the direction of the Spirit. The Spirit uh, revealed the Word, Ephesians chapter 3. The, the Word is the sword of the Spirit, the instrument of the Spirit. 
And so he said, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're, that is, if you walk after the direction of the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit guide you and direct you, you're not going to be doing whatever the flesh desires, whatever passions you have. You're not going to fulfill all of that. And notice carefully verse 17. It's a little difficult. What he's doing at verse 17 and 16, 17, and 18 is contrasting the life that is governed by fleshly desires and a life that is governed by the Holy Spirit. Now verse 17, for the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that they're contrary to one to another. Here's the desires of the flesh and then here's the desires of what the Holy Spirit wants me to do and they're not always in agreement. And it's like there's a war going on and they're fighting against one another. Now the end of verse 17 is where it's a little difficult. So that you do not do the things you wish. The things you wish is sin. And the reason that I don't sin is because I'm governed by the Spirit, not because the flesh doesn't desire that. So I may desire to, to, to drink. I might desire to say the bad word. I might desire to commit the fornication. But I don't do that. Why? Because I'm governed by the Spirit. I'm governed by the direction of the Spirit. Let's not make some application. Then we come back to the flow of the text. Young person, when, when you're choosing a mate and you say, I'm, I'm looking for someone I want to marry. But they don't have to be a Christian. I, I'm not interested whether, I just want them to be a good person. And you marry someone that's not governed by the Spirit, don't be surprised that when they want to sin, they'll sin because they're not governed by the Spirit. Don't be surprised. But then you choose to marry someone who is governed by the Holy Spirit. That when they have the temptation to commit sin, they're going to say, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that because the Holy Spirit says I can't. That makes all the difference in the world, the kind of person you marry, the kind of home you're going to have, the kind of children you'll end up with, how they'll turn out. Is, your, is the person you're dating and you're thinking about marrying, are, are they governed by the Spirit so that they don't do the things they're tempted to do? Or is it that they've rejected the Holy Spirit and they'll do whatever they're tempted to do? Verse 17 is a key to understand a lot of behavior. But verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You see, if you listen to the direction of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit's going to tell you is there was a coming of a new law. The Holy Spirit said that in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 to 34. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's telling you the new covenant has come. It tells you you're redeemed by Christ. If you listen to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, you're not under the law anymore. Now, if you walk after the Spirit, this liberty means you don't do the works of the flesh, verses 19 to 21. Now that could be a study within itself. In fact, that could be multiple studies. We could talk about the works of the flesh and have a whole lesson on fornication, another one on licentiousness, and another one on, on selfish ambitions. And that's not our purpose. I don't want us to lose the flow of the context. So he said that this liberty that you have in Christ, following after the Spirit, means you're not going to do the works of the flesh. Like what? Well, he said the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. As he talks about the works of the flesh, there are different types of sins. And let's categorize these. The first four of those are sexual sins. Notice he mentions adultery and fornication. Adultery is more specific. Fornication is a broader term. They're used interchangeably. What we may think of as fornication is sometimes called adultery in the text. Sometimes what we think of as adultery is called fornication. Matthew 19, 9 would be a case in point. The uncleanness has to do with moral uncleanness. Licentiousness or lasciviousness uh, deals with that which Walton desires. Unchaste handling of males and females there says that leads to that fornication. So the first four are sexual sins. The overt acts outside of marriage, uh, before marriage and outside the realm of marriage. And things that lead to that. So attitudes and thoughts that lead to those sexual sins. The next two are religious sins. There's idolatry, bowing before a false god. That can involve covetousness. And then sorcery. The King James will use the word rich, witchcraft. Uh, it's the word from which we get our word pharmacy. And some suggest that this has the idea of some charlatan casting a spell by using drugs to cause people then to think he is some great one and therefore he is... Uh, a great 
spiritual leader. So it's two religious sins that are mentioned. The next eight are relationship sins. And here are problems that are they're called the works of the flesh. For example, hatred. There's contentions and fighting. Jealousies, outburst of wrath. Anger, in other words. Selfish ambition, the attitude that leads to some of the relationship problems. Dissensions, division. Heresies. And envy. And so here are relationships, whether it being envious of someone, or maybe it's my attitude that causes me to be divided from them, or maybe it's introducing something that causes the division, or it may be that, that I have this attitude, it's going to be my way or no way, or it may be it's I just have hatred. There's a development of concepts going across those eight. And then the last three are in temperance sins. Such things as, notice he mentions murder, drunken, drunkenness, and revelries, and then he adds, and the such like. Things that are very similar that are not specifically mentioned. His point is, these works of the flesh you don't engage in if you're feeding upon the work of the Holy Spirit and you're walking in the liberty wherein Christ has made us free. Now the works of the flesh are all the same. They differ only in how we view them. They differ only in their temporal consequences or the different classes we put them in. But in other words, the sin of attitude is just as bad for my eternal nature, my eternal consequence, my eternal destiny is what I'm trying to say, as is murder. You see, I could lose my soul for hatred, but I could also lose my soul for murder. The consequence is the same. There's not much difference in these things. But I want you to go back to verse 19 with me. He said, the works of the flesh are evident. In other words, they're understandable, they're clear, they're plain to see. It's not hard to determine. There's, they we're not confused by gray areas like, is, is this wrong? Adultery, is it, is it really wrong or is it, it's, it's wrong? Well, what about licentiousness and lasciviousness? Is, is that okay as long as you don't commit adultery? No, it's wrong. It's clear. It's obvious. Not hard to determine. But then the rest of the chapter deals with developing the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible doesn't just do a, a message of, here's sin, don't have anything to do with that. We're through. But get rid of the sin. But here's what you need to do in its place. Here's, here's, here's what is in contrast to that. And he talks about developing the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits. But this is the fruit of the Spirit. It has many elements but in other words, you feed upon the Holy Spirit and here's the fruit that comes from that. Here's what you get when you feed upon the Spirit. When we don't have these characteristics, then we're not feeding upon the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the Spirit. Suppose I give you a seed and I tell you, this is an apple seed. Plant that and you'll have apples and you plant it and the next thing you know, you have cherries. You know what? You didn't get an apple seed. <laughs> Something's wrong here. So if you're having a different kind of fruit than what we read about in this text, then your seed over here wasn't from the Spirit. I need to check my seed. The seed came from somewhere else. It's going to produce the same fruit. Well, let's observe that D is strongly adversative, contrasting the fruit of the Spirit with the works of the flesh. It is, notice beginning at verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. A strong contrast. Here's the works of the flesh. And a strong contrast, if you feed upon the Spirit, you don't do that, but here's what you do. What are they? It's not, again, a smorgasbord that you say, well, I see the Holy Spirit offers love and peace and joy. I think I'll take the kindness. Uh, I'm not interested in self-control, though. I'm, I'm going to leave that one. I'll take love, but I'm not interested in peace. These are not the fruits of the Spirit, and I'll pick which fruits I want. If I follow the Spirit, here is the fruit. Here's the result. I'm going to take one, or I'm going to take all of them, or take none of them. So let's see what they are. The fruit of the Spirit is love, agape, seeking the highest interest in others. There's going to be real joy feeding upon the Holy Spirit. You know what that tells me? That tells me there's no joy in this over here. There may be some, some pleasure of the flesh, Hebrews 11. No one denies there's, that, that there's pleasure in the flesh. But that's only temporary. This is true, real joy. 
that comes through Christ. There's going to be peace with God and peace with others. We're going to have this long-suffering spirit. We're going to be kind. Notice this goodness. What's the idea of goodness? One writer says, the man that is kind sticks to the letter of his word. The man who is good goes far beyond that. So says Barclay. In other words, he does more than just being kind. He goes further than what might be expected of him. He's a good person. Faithfulness, not just faith. Your translation may use faith here, but it's not just having faith, but he's dependable. He endures, can be counted on. Gentle, meekness, your footnote will say, and self-control. And notice he said, against such there is no law. And over here, there's law against this. There's no law against any of these. It's not contrary to the principle of God. So let's learn some lessons from this great chapter. Some very practical things. We don't learn, not going to list everything we can learn from this. I learned from this chapter that liberty does not mean you can do anything you want to do. We have liberty in Christ, but that doesn't mean you can do anything you want to do. Liberty doesn't allow you to do that. We need to appreciate the freedom rather than take it for granted. Just like we do the freedom of our country. You don't take it for granted, you appreciate it. Same thing in the freedom in Christ. Appreciate that freedom. Don't take it for granted. Here's the third thing I learned. It's possible to fall from grace. Many of our Calvinistic friends, in fact, all of our Calvinistic friends for that matter, think it is impossible to fall from grace. Once in grace, always in grace, they will say. It's possible to fall from grace. Another lesson I learned is that just because one runs well doesn't mean they always will. And just because you're running the race now and you're running strong and you're running good, and you're advancing far. Doesn't mean that's the way it's always going to be. Something can hinder you. I learned from verse 14, the common denominator behind all commands is love. And what that means is I fulfill that law because of love. For God, love for others. And furthermore, I learned the sin of attitude is just as bad as some heinous crime or sin like drunkenness. If some brother was just stone drunk, you'd say, how awful, how awful. This brother filled with hatred, we ought to be saying, how awful, how awful. And finally, if brethren bicker and fuss, they will devour and they will destroy themselves and the local church. And we learned that here from Galatians chapter 5. Next week, we'll wind up by looking at chapter 6. We'll talk about the spiritual man. What that is and what that involves, what he does. We'll see that in our study next time. There may be one or more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?